to hear this tag team uh, presentation that we're going to do. Um, my name is Ann Caulfield, and I uh, live in Phoenixville in the borough. And I should introduce Deb in a few minutes here. I'm going to kind of get kicked off, kick off our talk tonight with sort of the more of the why should we do this? And maybe why are some of the things that we do? And I admit right from the start, I'm very much in the camp of the animals. Um, so I do have a little bit of bias. I feel like you know, they need to have a voice. And so it's, uh, it'll come across, I think, a little bit. But, so again, I, I want to I wanna present, you know, why do we, why do we have this conflict in nature? And, and we do, and there's definitely lots of research to support that. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Our ancestors, our, our human ancestors, did face some daunting odds of survival. There was, it was all considered a nature. Predators, floods, and drought. Um, so there was a genetic selection. And we feel, this is one theory, that there was a genetic selection for those that were good at conquering nature. You still hear that term, we're going to beat nature and conquer nature. Carries through even today. So our modern day human conflicts in part might have a genetic basis. We know that we like to have these big expansive lawns that maybe harken back to the, the days when we, we felt safer with big savanna and grass in front of us where we knew uh, what was coming. But our uncompromising domination for human species has just been a disaster for the biodiversity of this planet. Okay. And I'm sorry, you can you use hear? the microphone? share well. We take and we take and we don't tend to share resources on this planet well. 40 million acres of land converted each year into these generally we consider sterile habitats or the lawns. We like our grass on lawns. Since 1964, total area in the United States that has been designated as suburbia has increased by almost 6,000%. Um, we're losing about two acres per minute to development, and that was in 2002, because probably accelerated. Um, you know, I don't think there's any doubt about that at this point. 61,000 square miles of paved surface, 2001, significantly more than that at this point. And we have taken, for human use, 90, almost 100%, 95 to 97% of all available land in this country, or the lower 48, for our own purposes. So there is no longer somewhere else or someplace else for wildlife to go. So we have to learn to coexist. It's our thoughtlessness, and not necessarily out of necessity, that we have caused the extirpation of countless animals and the loss of their habitat. But here's the good part, because I hate these doom and gloom <laughs> stories about nature. There is a growing body of evidence that suggests that most species, not all, but most, can survive and even thrive living alongside humans. We just have to learn how to supply and live and allow them to have the few basic needs. So I have a little to-do list before death comes up to get started. This is, uh, here are some pictures I took of my little house in the borough um, of things that we can start to do. Talking about native plants and gardening, that's a whole other presentation in and of itself. Um, and I think they've had some people come in and talk about native plants, but I think it's always nice to have a refresher um, of what these plants do. Um, they're, they can be attractive, and they support the systems that support all of us. So insect populations, herbivorous insects, that really are the, the framework and the base of all of our, um, of all of our ecosystems. Little mason bee houses. 
helping out with pollinators and native pollinators. Butterfly gardens, plant it in with your vegetables, you know, just mix it up. I don't have a lot of space, but you can, you can really do this in an attractive way, and I know other people here uh, that live in the borough have done that too. And yes, you do have, you know, there's rabbits and there's groundhogs, so you know, my little blueberries have, have some protection around them, but uh, it can be done on your to-do list. Don't use pesticides, don't use herbicides. There are alternatives. These things just wreak havoc, uh, literally from the ground up. Keep your cat inside. <laughs> this is a tough one, this is a very emotional one. It's a, it's a, a lot of controversy, a lot of pushback on that. Um, but they do make an impact. It's not their fault, it's just how they are. 1.3 to 4 billion birds per year estimated anywhere from 6.3 to 22 billion males per year are killed by domestic cats. So it is tough. You have a cat that likes to go out, it's used to going out, and, and arguably it's going to be a more um, enriched life for a cat to be outside doing cat things, but we can make the indoor environment more engaged for them, more enriched, so we can have a, a mentally healthy cat and a safe wildlife population and a safer cat. I mean, I, uh, I don't know those of you who know I'm a veterinarian, but I probably last week alone saw five cats that came in with, with bite wounds from other cats fighting. And if you've never had a cat bite, they are painful. So we also see diseases transmitted through these bites. And these are viral diseases that we don't have a cure for. So feline immunodeficiency viruses, feline leukemia viruses, uh, all by cats fighting, fleas near the whole nine yards. So staying inside. Ohio State University uh, does a lot of work with stress management in cats and it <clears throat> influences stress and disease. And they've come up with uh, uh, a lot of good suggestions on how to make the indoor environment more engaged and enriched for them. So you know, going to their website, Humane Society also has information on how to gradually make an outdoor cat or an indoor outdoor cat <clears throat> an indoor cat. You do it slowly, you do it gradually, and it definitely can be done successfully and everybody can be happy. You can have your catio, who wouldn't want a catio? You give them some sun and outdoor exposure. A little outdoor cat enclosures that can come in all shapes and sizes. Um, just allow them to, you know, to be out and exposed, but they're safe and wildlife is safe. Educate yourself. Um, this is a, if you're interested in gardening in any way or plants in any way, this is a fabulous book. And we, I believe they do have it here in the library. Um, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. It, it really changes the way, and I yeah. know Rodney's nodding his head there, it really changes the way that you approach um, your world, I think, and, and it's positive. It starts off a little bit, you know, the doom and gloom, but it really is positive. And Dr. Talamay really believes that it's up to us in the suburbs, because as we learn, that's pretty much becoming a majority of, uh, of land space now as the suburbs, that we really don't have a choice. But we can be successful, we can provide a place for these animals to live, uh, live out their lives, and live successfully and thrive uh, alongside us. Part of that education is going to be listening to Deb, because she's an amazing wildlife rehabilitator, very experienced, and uh, on Island Rock Wildlife Rehab Clinic, and I'd love to have her come up and, yeah, do your part. And she says she doesn't need the microphone. So. I definitely don't need the microphone. Can you all hear me? <laughs> I don't generally need the microphones. Thanks, Annie. Um, a lot of times people hear about wildlife rehabilitators and they don't know what that is. Uh, what we do is we take a... And how do I get to the next presentation? Sorry, I didn't. Oh, that was easy. Okay. Okay. Uh, as wildlife rehabilitators, we take in orphaned, injured, and sick native wildlife. Not cats and dogs, that's Annie's department. Um, we take in native wildlife with the goal of treating them and then releasing them back into the wild. 
We don't keep them as pets. We don't keep them. Occasionally, an animal is kept as an education animal if, if it is non-releasable. But for the most part, it's released back to the wild. That's what our entire goal is. Uh, right now, there are 34 active rehabbers in the state of Pennsylvania working in 25 facilities in the entire state. Now, you've got me uh, in Malvern. I'm actually on Diamond Rock Road, so we're on the other side of Paoli from the town of Malvern. Um, you've got Philly Metro Wildlife Center and King of Prussia. You've got the Ark in Bucks County. That's three in southeastern Pennsylvania. That is all a real anomaly in the state of Pennsylvania. There are county after county after county that don't have any wildlife rehabilitators. I thought Schuylkill. I'm sorry? Schuylkill Center is closed. Um, the rehabilitator, uh, the two rehabilitators that were there, and all the volunteers, uh, myself included, are now at Philly Metro Wildlife Center. They are looking for a new rehabilitator at Schuylkill Center, but I don't know if they've found one yet. Um, I run a home-based rehabilitation center. My husband is very tolerant. We have wild animals in the house at all times, in cages. They're, they don't run free. Um, but um, I started off doing raccoons, foxes, skunks, bats, groundhogs, and coyotes and squirrels, and then decided that I'm too old to do the 20 hour days anymore. So now I just specialize in bats. Bats need a lot of help. So I, I am doing strictly bats right now. Um, with my sub permittees, who are people that are under my license, we treat about 300 animals a year. Um, last year I had over 48 neonate bank bat pups, which are about the size of my of the first joint of my pinky. Um, they were quite challenging to take care of. Contrary to popular perception, I'm just doing a little plug here, we are not funded by any government organization. We are strictly uh, donation driven. So if you ever take an animal to a wildlife rehabilitator, Please give a donation, even if it's just a little little one. It just helps. Every little bit helps. The number one. Oh, the number one reason why animals come into a wildlife rehab setting is because of some sort of human interference. Whether the, an animal has been hit by a car, animal control has taken a mother out of your house, and all of a sudden you're left with babies. Um, there's all sorts of reasons, you're cutting down trees and, you know, you, you find a nest of squirrels or a nest of birds afterwards. But the number one reason is human intervention or human interference. Does anybody know what this is? Just out of curiosity? That's a three-week-old coyote pup that was found very close to the Exton Mall. So, People, I see this on next door all the time, our, our local groups, that we don't have coyotes in this area. Uh -uh. We have coyotes They're in this all, area. In all 67 counties. Right? Every county in Pennsylvania has coyotes. Yeah. So, um, so what my goal is tonight is to teach you how to peacefully coexist with these animals. Uh, hopefully my presentation will answer if you have any questions. Uh, but if not, I'm happy to answer questions after I'm done. We've got kind of a short period of time right now. One of the biggest questions I get when people call me is, why is this animal in my yard? Some people are almost appalled by the fact that there's a skunk in their backyard and they live out in the country in Chester Springs or something and they, you know, they don't expect to have wildlife there. Uh, I realize that a lot of people here are animal lovers, and, and Annie said her bias is towards animals. Oh, mine is so far to the, 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 towards the animal side. But, um, but sometimes we all have problems with animals. Uh, in our house, we live in the woods on Diamond Rock Road, and we had squirrels in our attic. We had not your, just your typical gray squirrels that you see all the time. We also had flying squirrels, which the gray squirrels are active in the daytime. Flying squirrels are active at nighttime. We had lots of things going on in our attic in our house. It was very disruptive. And squirrels are rodents. They chew things. They chew wire. They chew insulation. They chew wiring to uh, air conditioning, we discovered, when the summertime came. And I'll get into how you can deal with things like that. 
One of the things that we have a problem with wildlife is because this is a very densely populated area. There's development going on everywhere. Animals are just looking for the same thing that we all are, some food and a place to live and raise their family. They're not out trying to make your life miserable. They're just trying to do what all of us are trying to do. But when you're talking about doing all of this development and eliminating the habitat, we are going to collide, like Annie said, and it happens a lot. Uh, you probably see more animals at this time of year because it's the beginning of baby season. Almost all the mammals and many, many birds are all having babies now. Um, just in case you're concerned that you're seeing too many animals, most of them will disperse in the fall. They don't stay in, in the same area. So what I want to try to do is give you some general hints on how to exist with the animals without them causing problems for you, also at ways you can help the animals, and also give you a little bit of PR on why they're worth saving. Just some interesting facts that I've learned in my years of experience. These are some of the guys that we've raised and released. Okay, first thing you think about with raccoons garbage, right? They, um, I get calls from Philadelphia all the time. People say, there's raccoons out in my alley and I'm afraid to go out. There's gangs of them. Well, how many is, you know, how many really are there? Well, there's two of them. I've seen two and I'm afraid to go outside. Well, you know, do you have garbage cans in your alley? Yes, yes. Uh, it, do you have lids on them? Well, no, we, we lost the lids years ago, so we don't bother with that. You're providing food for them. The first thing to do to reduce the amount of conflict is eliminate their attractants. What they're attracted to? Food, water, shelter. If you can eliminate those things, you'll eliminate the reason for them to be there. Uh, a lot of times people call me and they live in a townhouse community and they feed the animals out on their, their little back patio and their neighbors two doors down are calling animal control and having those animals killed. So if you feed wildlife, I'm, I'm a villain there, I feed wildlife, but if you do, please don't do it if you live in a really tight uh, area of condos or townhouses, because you don't know what your neighbors are doing, and it, it just causes problems. It attracts the animals to that area, and I always say, if you feed them, they will come. But raccoons are notorious for that. They are so smart. Raccoons, if you put food out for your cat or your dog, you will have a raccoon there within days. They, they just have this sense of smell and they're gonna find it. And they're not gonna give up either. Um, so trash cans. Um, first thing to do is if you have trash outside, make sure you have a secure lid on it. They have some that you can turn to, to lock in place. If you don't, put a bungee cord across from both handles uh, interesting story, a friend of mine lived in Haverford and um, she was having a big problem with raccoons in her trash can. She tried the bungee cords, it didn't work. So she got those big spring bungee cords, you know, the ones that are the springs, and she put them on there. Well, the raccoons could get into her trash cans, but her garbage men couldn't. They complained. <laughs> so, raccoons are the most tactile animal on the planet. They have ten times more nerve endings in their hands, in their paws, than we do in our hands. So they, they can work anything. We have um, outside cages. When I was doing raccoons, we have outside cages that have a little hook on the door so that we could go in there and feed them, clean the cage, but they couldn't get out. So many times I'd go out there in the morning and they would have locked me out. I had a little screwdriver that I could use to pry up between the door to get in. So raccoons are amazingly intelligent animals. So if you still have a problem with your garbage cans, Try putting it out the morning of garbage pickup. I know that's a pain in the butt, um, but or keep it in your garage until the time the time comes. Feed pets inside. If you have your dog outside and you put food out there for them, you're going to have animals. You're going to have wildlife. Um, if you have holes in your outside walls, in your roof, in your fascia, anything like that, you want to repair them because animals will get in. They, if they're looking for a nesting place, animals always look for quiet and dark. If you provide that for them, they're gonna move in. 
Um, close off your, if you're having problems, close off the crawl spaces beneath your decks or, or sheds or porches or whatever, because animals love to get under there. Now typically they're not going to cause any problems. I get calls all the time from people that are really concerned. One groundhog is really not going to make your shed sink. You know, he's, he's going to dig his little burrow underground. And a lot of times they go so far underground, they go like six feet under, that you're, you don't even notice it on the top. But if you're concerned and you don't want them around there, then um, close them off. The thing you have to realize is animals are not going to change. You have to change the environment. A big concern of a lot of people is vegetable gardens. Groundhogs are getting into my vegetable gardens. Yeah, they will. If you want to keep animals out of your vegetable gardens, what you have to do is dig about a foot underground all the way around the perimeter and use something like hardware cloth or, or some sort of um, metal mesh and, and put it in the ground a foot under and angle it outward and go all the way around the perimeter of your garden. That way, no matter what animal comes along, no matter how good a digger they are, they're going to go here, they're going to get to the metal. They're going to move over a foot, they're going to dig here, they're going to get to the metal. That's the only way I know of, of keeping animals out of your garden. It, it's an investment, but it will last forever. Or, probably as long as will last. Um, let's see. Uh, if you still have a problem with animals, think about other sources of food. Bird feeders. We have deer that come under our deck and eat the, the bird seed that the birds and the squirrels have dropped all the time. So if it's an issue for you, take your bird feeders in at night and clean up the, the uh, bird seed that's, that's fallen down. That, provide, that eliminates a food source. If you've got a pond, a lot of people in this area have ponds and they have beautiful koi fish that they're really proud of and everything and great blue herons come along and think this is a great source of food. Raccoons dabble in there and get the fish. What you have to do is you have to make it deep enough and provide hiding places for your koi. If you just submerge cinder, submerge cinder blocks that's a place for them to hide where the animals can't get to them and the, the great blue herons won't see them. So that's, that's one way of doing it. Um, even stacking bricks or rocks with some cavities in the area, that will prevent um, predators from being able to get to your koi. Probably can't read it from back there, but anytime anybody thinks about a skunk, the first thing they think of is this gray. So, I want to give you a little bit of information about skunks. They're primarily solitary. They're poor climbers, um, but they can swim, which is interesting. They have incredibly bad eyesight. They can see about three feet in front of them. So when you come up to a skunk, all of a sudden they see nothing, see nothing, see nothing, see nothing. Goliath is there. So they're petrified. You know, so you, you definitely do not want to corner a skunk. What you want to do is, um, Make sure that you go up to them if you come up to an animal at night and say there's a skunk on your front step. If you come up to them, just in a very normal tone of voice, just talk to them and walk around. If you can avoid them, do it. But otherwise, just make a wide berth and no sudden movements, no loud noises. Either of those are going to scare them and that's when they're going to spray. Uh, they're really shy animals, and they're so docile, and the babies are just adorable. As you can see, we've got a couple of them here. Um, they're really, really cute, cute babies. And they're also very intelligent. They're primarily nocturnal, as a lot of our wildlife is. Um, and they're almost sluggish in movement. What they usually do is they walk around with their nose to the ground, and what they're doing is they're looking for grubs and insects in your lawn. They're wonderful for gardeners because they do take care of all sorts of different insects in the area. And uh, what I read in the summer, as much as 70% of their diet is various insects, both adults and larval forms, which is, I mean, what more could you ask for? Um, they also eat small rodents, frogs, toads, snakes, uh, eggs of turtles and ducks, carrion, and some fruits and vegetables. They eat stink bugs. Is that a plus? Yes. We can provide a constant. Makes sense, doesn't it? 
And what the uh, spray is, is it's just a form of musk. It's called uh, mercaptan, and it's highly repellent to all mammals. Um, and it comes from glands on either side of their rectum. They're like little ducts, and they can act actually spray 15 to 20 feet. So um, you definitely do not want to them. <laughs> um, let's see, I did cover that. Don't they? bang their foot? What they do, that's what I was going to get into, their warning signals. What they do, first of all, is they start walking very stiff-legged. They can jump backwards. They can just pound their feet like, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to stomp their feet, make themselves look big and dangerous. And the last thing they do is they turn their body into a U. So their butt and their face, it both facing at you. If you've gotten a skunk to that point, you want to run the opposite direction because you've scared him to the point where he does not want anything more to do with you. This is like a last resort for them. This, they don't use this at the drop of a, a, a hat. I mean, they don't have very much of this liquid in their bodies, and it takes them a while to replenish it. So they say that they've got like two or three sprays in them before they really have to replenish it. They're not going to spray you if you're walking down the sidewalk and you know not not approaching them loud. Or, and I've had people that have called me and they say, you know, well I got sprayed. I, I walked in my front door and I saw the skunk and I screamed and he sprayed me. Well, yeah, you made a loud noise. You scared him. So, um, and there's also a recipe on the internet if you do get uh, sprayed. Um, that's what I want to say. Dogs. Dogs go running up to skunks. They, you know, can I play with you? Can I eat you? So that's why they get sprayed. They're all of a sudden they're nose to nose with a skunk, and this poor little defenseless skunk, which is you know smaller than your cat. Most most um, skunks weigh about eight pounds as an adult, so they're they're little teeny tiny things. And you know you've got this huge Great Dane that's gone for this skunk. So that's why your dogs get sprayed. There is a recipe on the internet that you can use, it's um, hydrogen peroxide and Dawn, and I can't think of the third ingredient, but if you look up on the internet for a recipe for skunk uh, removal, that'll do it. Uh, people also find skunks a lot of times in window wells. If you think about it, when, when they walk they, with their babies, they do a little Congo line, they're the, you know, single file, they're trying to do like nose to tail, and occasionally one of them maybe has ADD or something, and he goes, oh, look, a squirrel. And all of a sudden, he can't see where his mother is. A lot of times, they're doing their little walk, and they fall into a window well because they don't see that the ground is dropped off in front of them. They're little teeny tiny things. They can't climb out of a window well. So what you want to do is very slowly and you know, quietly take a board and put it in the window well at an angle no more than 45%, 45 degrees and walk away. The skunk will climb out of there. We've done it ourselves and, and it does work. Um, I've also read that they can be repelled by the smell of marigolds or cucumbers, but I don't know anybody that's actually done that and where it's actually worked. And it also says that they can be uh, repelled by motion sensitive lights. It doesn't work. We have them in our house. It doesn't work. are one of the most amazing, amazing creatures on the planet. About one out of every five mammals on the planet is a bat. There's about uh, 1,100 species of bats worldwide. And what you think of when you see a bat is what Hollywood is propagating, you know, Dracula and, and uh, you know, all these vampires and things like that. Our little bats are about this big. Their wingspan can be you know, six, eight inches. They're tiny little things. And they're very docile. They don't, they don't want to bite you. Uh, they can eat a half of their weight in insects every night, which is about 5,000 insects. A lactating female can eat double that amount, which is about, um, you know, 10,000 a night, including mosquitoes, which spread with, uh, West Nile virus and all sorts of other things now. They've got all sorts of other diseases that are being spread by mosquitoes. 
Uh, just an interesting fact, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, there's a colony of 200,000 gray bats, which spend their summer in a cave uh, near the city. They consume over 220 tons of insect per night. So think about 440 half-ton pickup trucks filled with bugs. That's a lot of bugs. Uh, if a grown adult human ate as much as a bat did nightly, it would be about 100 to 150 pounds of french fries or 30 to 50 large pizzas. So if you can do that, you can eat as much as a bat. Um, they're the only nocturnal um, agricultural pest eater in the United States. Birds can eat agricultural pest insects, but they're not uh, active at night. The ones that are active at night are the hawks and the owls, which are primarily afternoon rodents and things like that. So they save uh, farmers just a fortune in cancer-causing insecticides and billions of billions of dollars. Um, they're really important for organic farmers. They actually line their fields with bat houses. And you were saying you've got a bat house? Bat houses are wonderful. I'll get into that. Um, you think about how bats can find insects. What they do is they use something called echolocation. They open their mouth, they emit a sound, and it goes to an object, and it echoes back at them. And they, in their little teeny tiny little brain, they can figure out what the object, the size of the object, the shape of it, how much it's moving, where it's moving to, they can detect a single human hair across this room in pitch darkness. They're fascinating. When you think about um, the um, the army has studied um, this for sonar operations and things like that, and some of the places have rooms of computer equipment and everything to do this. They do this all in their little brain, which is like the size of my pinky fingernail. So they're just amazing animals. When you look at pictures of bats, a lot of times their mouths are open and they're baring their teeth and they just want, you know, they, they look like they're such vicious animals. They're echolocating that photographer. They want to see what it is and, you know, it's something they have to worry about. Uh, let's see. The other thing is bat guano is wonderful fertilizer for gardens. So if you have bat houses, collect the guano from underneath and throw it in your garden. The main thing that bats do that is so phenomenal is pollination and seed dispersal. I'm not going to read this whole list, but if you like tequila, if you like anything like that, if you like chocolate, which I just mentioned two of my favorite things, you can thank a bat because they help with the pollination of it. Um, the way they do that is, if you think about it, birds also pollinate plants. They, they ingest some of it and then poop out the seeds, but they tend to poop out when they're, at their, when they're roosting. Bats do it as they fly, so they scatter the seeds all over the place. African savannas, uh, rainforests, all have been propagated by bats. Um, there are over 450 commercial products and 80 medicines that can thank bats for the um, pollination and seed dispersal. Over 95% of rainforest regrowth comes from, from seeds that have been spread by fruit bats. Now, we don't have fruit bats in this area, but... 95%? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they pollinate agave plants, which yield mezcal and tequila. When these plants are hand pollinated, they're production drops to one three thousandths of those plants that are pollinated by, visited by bats. Uh, and the scientists have shown that seeds that pass through a bat's stomach nearly always germinate, but those same seeds simply fall to the ground and do not. So without fruit bats, we'd be without entire forests. Now, like I said, our bats in this area are all insectivorous. They, they, we don't have fruit bats, but if you go to any of the islands, all of them are fruit bats, so any tropical areas. Biggest threats to bats are loss of habitat. Um, we're losing old barns, old growth forests, our trees. Um, they hide under the bark of, of some of these trees. Church steeples, we don't do church steeples very much anymore, and that's where, you know, you the bats in the belfry, that's where we got that from. Um, 
Now, a lot of the hibernation caves uh, or mines are being closed up because people are being stupid and going down there and being very reckless and doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So they're, they're barring up the, the uh, entrances, and in some cases, they're putting solid walls on them. And they have actually entombed a lot of bats doing that. Now they're a lot smarter and they're doing it with bars that the bats can get through, but the people shouldn't be able to. Sometimes they still do. Um, bats, some cat, uh, bats live in caves year round, but they usually have a different cave for the summer and then one for the winter. Increased pesticide use it has just decimated um, the, the insects the bats eat. If you think about it, we've got um, diseases that are uh, being found in bats, in snakes, in frogs, in some of the bees. What do they all have in common? They're either insects or they're insect eaters. I mean, we've been saying for years that white nose syndrome, which is um, a devastating disease to the bats, all of us rehabbers have been saying for years that it's caused by lowered immunity based on all the insecticide that they're, they're eating. Um, okay. Most of, uh, one of the reasons, another reason, the low reproductive rate. Most of our bats only produce one pup. Their, their offspring are called pups. Isn't that cute? One pup per year. So for the uh, 7.5 million bats that have been lost to white nose in mostly the eastern states, it's going to take a long time. And it's never going to be, the numbers are never going to be up to where they were uh, previously. An interesting thing about bats is the, the bats mate in the fall, the females store the sperm in their bodies, and then they um, move it along and fertilize, uh, fertilize, um, yeah, fertilize themselves so that the babies are born when the insects are coming out in May and June, which is just a fascinating thing. Um, Wind turbines are causing a problem. Um, they did a lot of studies initially and were checking the number of birds and bats at the bottom of wind turbines. And they were found that the numbers were very, very low. But then they realized the predators are hanging out very close by and getting them all. Because they were going out once a week to count the number of, of bats and birds that were there. And the numbers are a lot higher. The wind Turbine companies are working with um, Bat Conservation International now to come up with a way, so, with numerous ways, so that it doesn't affect the bats as much. Uh, yes. Um, how about white nose syndrome? I'm going to get to that. Okay. That's the next one. <laughs> um, and you think, oh. okay, if bats can detect a human hair, something that small across the room, how are they hitting into these wind turbines? Well, the wind turbines are so huge, and they say that it, it forms something called barotrauma, which it changes the pressure of the air in that area, and their organs rupture and they die. So a lot of times they haven't actually crashed into the wind turbine itself or the, the blade, but just being in that, that air pressure has, has killed them. Uh, so they're, they're looking at different ways to avoid that problem, maybe turn the turbines on only in the daytime, which the bats won't be flying in the daytime, or um, there, there's sort of different ways, painting them different colors, they're coming up with all sorts of things, because the, the wind turbines create heat, which attracts the insects, which is what attracts the bugs. White nose syndrome has decimated the population. It is a cold-loving fungal disease that started in Albany, in a cave outside of Albany in 2006. Since then, it's been spreading further east and south, and I mean, not east, the west. Um, it's now in 32 states and five provinces, and there are two additional states that this disease has been found in caves, but not, not confirmed by bats yet. What it does is it gets on their wing membranes and it, it, it forms around their mouth and that's why they call it white nose syndrome. It looks like they've been uh, a snorting powder or something around their mouths. But it gets on their wings and it irritates them. And this is when they're hibernating in caves in the winter time. It irritates them, they wake up and these bats are insectivorous, they're hungry, 
So what do they do? They go outside to try to find some, some insects to eat. It's the middle of winter. We have no insects to eat. They end up freezing and starving to death. So, um, and there's been a number of things that people have come up with as far as solutions to this. Um, they're talking about, since it's a fungal disease, well, let's spray fungicide. Well, you're in a cave environment, which is its whole ecosystem of things that are all interdependent. You can't just go in there and focus on one thing without disturbing everything else. So there are a number of uh, scientists, there's a lot of grants, government grants right now, uh, going on trying to find some way to resolve this. Okay. So what to do if you encounter an animal? Uh, this is one of our red bats. What you probably see in your yard flying around your house is probably a big brown bat. If you see some that are hanging in trees, not they're not crevice dwellers like uh, big brown bats. If you see them hanging in trees, and sometimes they'll hang by one foot, and they'll look like a curled up dead leaf. They're, they're so smart. Um, and that, that's a red bat. Um, so first of all, if you find an animal that you think needs help, watch him for a while first. Um, if he's injured, um, obviously bleeding, if he's in the middle of a road, if he can't breathe, then you need to get into action. But otherwise, call a rehabber because not all animals need help that are uh, in your yard. <laughs> if you do find an animal that does need help, please don't pick him up with your bare hands. If it's an animal like a raccoon, a fox, a skunk, a bat, a groundhog, or a coyote, which are called rabies vector species, which uh, they're a, a type of uh, animal that has a higher risk for getting rabies and being able to transmit it to other animals or humans by a bite. Um, so each state has their own determination of a, what a rabies vector species is in Pennsylvania. Raccoon, fox, skunk, bat, groundhog, and coyote. If you pick up any of those with bare hands and you get saliva on your bare skin, which is how rabies is spread, by the way, it's not spread by blood, by urine, by feces, it's spread by saliva or contact with mucous membranes. Um, if you get saliva on your bare skin, the only way to detect if that animal has rabies or not is to euthanize it, cut off its head, and have the brain tissue um, examined by a lab in, in Lionville. So you're rescuing that animal for naught. So please, always wear gloves. The other thing is, you, you want to protect yourself. These animals have teeth. They don't know that you're trying to protect them. All of a sudden, Godzilla is picking them up. They have no reason to believe that you're helping them. So please, use gloves, use a towel. Um, if you find an animal like that, usher it into a box or a cat or a dog carrier. Use a, a big, thick towel, gloves, even a broom if you have to very gently usher them into, into the, the box. Because um, it is a death sentence for any rabies vector species animal. If the animal is uninjured and you've got it in your yard, there's no reason to fear him. There's no reason to try to do anything. You're going to have animals in your backyard. You don't need to fear them, you need to respect them. You don't want to touch them. You want to teach your children, your grandchildren, don't go up to any animal that they don't know and try to pet it. And that goes for dogs and cats that they don't know too. Um, my vet had a, a case a couple weeks ago where someone out in Honeybrook found um, cute little kittens. And so they were playing with them, the, the children's soccer team was playing with them. It turns out that the kittens had rabies. They had to be euthanized. Everyone, you know, they, they were euthanized to be tested. They had rabies. Every one of those kids had to go through the series of rabies shots, which hopefully they all had insurance because they're very expensive. 750 bucks. What's that? 750-ish. You got a good deal. I've heard of 1,100. I've heard yeah. of, I have 21,000. 21,000? It, it was a mistake. Oh, okay. I, mean, I was they, gonna say, yeah. They, they told me it okay, was legitimate. Yeah. I, I'd find a different place to go if it was 21,000. Yeah. Um, so if you come across a skunk, like I said, no loud noises, no sudden movements, you just walk around them, talk in a normal tone of voice, and you won't get sprayed. 
if it's a raccoon, a fox, a groundhog, make loud noises, clap your hands, anything like that. Typically, they're going to run away. Now, a fox has gotten so used to being around people that they're, they might go like this and then turn around and look to see if you're still coming. They're not going to like run a mile and a half away from you. They're very used to being around people. But still, that it'll get them away from your door. If it's a coyote, don't turn your back and run away. What you want to do is make really loud noises and make yourself look really big. Do this, and the coyote's going to run away. Now, most of the time when people see coyotes in Chester County, they're um, either injured or hit by a car, or it's in the middle of winter and we've got, you know, 17 inches of snow and four inches of ice on top of it, and they're starving. Otherwise, you don't usually see them. Um, if necessary, you can throw little pebbles or sticks, not to hurt them, but just to, to scare them away. If you find a baby animal, and that's, um, let's see, that's a, a red fox kit, a raccoon, and a skunk. They're all ones that we've raised and released. Not all babies that are alone are orphans. Some animals don't stay with their young in order to protect them. Two very well-known ones in this area are deer, white-tailed deer, and rabbits. They never stay with their babies. They'll come back two or three times a day to feed them. But other than that, they stay away from them because if they stay with them, it's going to attract predators. You know, um, rabbits have no way of defending their babies. So what they do is they just stay away from them and they come back only at night. So if you have, um, a lot of times this time of year, people are out gardening or putting mulch in their, their uh, backyards or something, and they come across a nest of baby rabbits, which usually is not something, I always thought they had dig, dig, uh, deep holes and that's where they live. No, what they, it usually is is a shallow indentation with the babies in it and then with dried grasses or the mother's fur over top of it. If you come across a rabbit's nest, leave it alone. If you have a dog that won't leave it alone, you can either put a milk crate, a laundry basket upside down, or even straddle your lawnmower over the, the nest to keep your dog away. Um, in a couple weeks, they're gonna be gone anyway. They disperse very quickly. Rabbits, uh, they're rabbits. They breed a lot and they grow up fast. Um, but they do not need to go into a wildlife rehab. If you find that your dog or cat, please don't have your cats outside, if you have your dog has found a rabbit's nest and one of them is injured, you want to remove that from the nest because the mother will not go back to the nest if she smells blood. Um, okay, so if you find a baby, observe it from a distance. I had one woman, probably 10 years ago now, <coughs> that said, I sat up with that rabbit all night long to make sure no predators came and got it. And the mother never came back. If you're going to sit next to it, no, the mother will not come back. You want to observe the babies from a distance. Within an hour or two, mom should come back, other than rabbits and deer. But if you've got a raccoon, a groundhog, a skunk, a fox, mom should be around somewhere. If two hours has passed and they have not, you have not seen an adult anywhere, then they need to come in. Something has happened to mom. Um, the, the, Mothers in the wildlife community have very strong maternal instincts. They are not going to abandon their babies unless they are threatened themselves. If you try to relocate babies and the mother, people a lot of times have thought that they've been doing something really good and relocating the whole family. Mom is going to be in an area where she doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know where food, water, or shelter is. She's going to ditch her babies and try to preserve herself. The other reason they would abandon their babies is sometimes if there is something wrong with the baby, and I don't know how they know it, but I had a fox kid that came in years ago. His eyes were still closed. He was an adorable little ball of fur, and the people had said that the mother came and moved all the, the three other fox kids and left this one. They kept going back and smelling it, but they left him there. When that fox's eyes opened, he was blind. Now how on earth she knew that, I have no idea. Um, 
we, we had great discussions about that in wildlife conferences, and nobody knows, but it has been seen in other cases where um, uh, hydroencephalic babies, sometimes you can't even tell, but they've got the swollen head, you can't even tell when they're little teeny tiny ones, but they grow up and that's, that's what they end up, and somehow the mothers knew. Um, okay, and the other thing um, is mothers will usually kick out the male offspring of their, their male offspring in the fall, but sometimes the females will stay with mom through the spring and even into the next summer. So if you see a lot of babies and adults in your yard, they're not always going to be there, they're going to be dispersing. Now the different thing is if you find a bat in your house. Um, first of all, it depends on the time of year, because what I tell people to do, if it's in the middle of summertime and one is in their house, I tell them to take it and I'll explain how to get it and put it outside on a vertical surface like a tree trunk. If it's the middle of winter, you can't do that. There's no insects out there, they're going to freeze. Also, if it's a baby, and sometimes the, the pups, when they're getting a little bit older, will look just like an adult because they grow fast. So if you find a bat in your house, feel free to call. I'll give out my business card. Feel free to call. I'll tell you exactly what to do. Um, they use, you never want to catch a bat in flight. They have teeny tiny bones and you'll break them. What you want to do is wait until they land and they usually will land on a surface like a um, curtains or try to get behind a picture frame, something vertical. And what you do is you take a really small uh, Rubbermaid or Tupperware container and a piece of cardboard. You put on a pair of gloves, put the Tupperware container over top of the bat, and very gently slide the cardboard underneath it. And if it's in the summertime and it's determined to be an adult, you take them outside, put them on a vertical surface like a tree trunk. Most bats cannot take off from the ground. If you find one on the ground or you put them on the ground, he may flop around, he's going to look like he's injured, or he's just going to freeze. And you're going to think that he's either dead or something's very wrong with him. No, they can't take off from the ground. They need a vertical surface. They need to soar down. Um, usually they're in your home inadvertently. They don't want to live with us. And the other thing is, unlike rodents, bats are not rodents, by the way. Everybody says flying rats. No, they're not. They're not rodents. Um, they don't want to be in your house. They don't chew wood, they don't chew insulation. They're not after our food either, they're after insects. So if you've got some fruit on your, your counter and you've got a lot of bugs, maybe they are after your food, but they're after the bugs that are after your food. Um, and they can squeeze into a hole the size of a nickel. Um, so it's hard to keep them out. A lot of the houses in this area are very old. You'll never be able to keep them you know, every bat out if it wants to get in your house for the winter time or whatever. Um, if you do have bats in your attic and you have an issue with them, there's something called an exclusion device that you can have installed or you can put up yourself. And all it does is allows the bats to leave but not come back in. It's really simple, but it's illegal to do May through August in this area because that's when the bats have their pups and you don't want to abandon the pups. You know, have the mother be able to leave, but not be able to come back to feed them. Like I said, you're always gonna have wildlife in your area. You know, I, I hope most people here appreciate them and enjoy watching them. We watch them all the time and just have such great joy watching them. Um, Please don't call animal control for any animals in your yard, in your house, anything like that. If it's one of the species that I said is a rabies vector species, they will kill them. Um, it's not something they choose to do. It's in their regulations as being a wildlife uh, removal service. Um, they're licensed by the Pennsylvania Game Commission, same as I am. They must kill that animal unless you really let them release it right on your property which typically if you're spending $200, $250, you're probably not going to have someone come in to take the animal from your house and put it outside. Um, a lot of the companies that I've heard of are very unscrupulous. They will look you in the eye, especially if they realize that you like animals, and they'll say, 
I have this great park down the road, I'm going to release them there. No, they're not. They're not going to risk their licenses. They're going to kill that animal, including the babies, which I can't imagine how anybody could do that. But anyway, um, also, please don't trap and relocate animals. A lot of the times, that's a death sentence for the animal, too. You don't know if the area where you're taking the animal is an appropriate area for that species. You don't know if that area is already at carrying capacity for that species. And sometimes the animals, the ones that are more territorial, will end up driving this animal out and he'll never be able to find another home territory. And he'll end up dying trying to, to find food and territory. So that's never a solution. The other thing is nature abhors a vacuum. If you move one out and it's appropriate habitat, another one's going to move right in. So if you support animal control companies, removing animals from your yard, from wherever, you're doing a never-ending source of revenue for them. Remember, animals want quiet and dark. If you can eliminate that, a lot of times they're going to move on anyway. I told you the story about us having um, squirrels, flying squirrels and gray squirrels in our attic. We used something a local guy developed, a guy from Norristown, and it's called the Evictor Ball. It's a strobe light. It drove the squirrels crazy. If I had to live in that room, it would drive me crazy too. But it worked. And sometimes you don't even have to go to that point. Sometimes if you just, if you have animals in your attic, if you turn on lights up there and put on a radio and play, have both of them going 24 hours a day, especially playing Power 99, which would drive me out of any area too, but it's a great radio station for repelling wildlife from your rooms in your house. Um, so you don't have to spend a penny to have animals removed from your property. The best thing to do is to have them leave on their own. They're, that way if they have babies, they're going to take them too. Okay, another thing, be careful when driving. Different times of year have different hazards. In the springtime, there's mothers that are frantically going out finding food while their babies are sleeping, so they're just frantic. In the uh, spring and fall is uh, bird migration time. There are major amounts of birds out there. In the fall, some of the mammals, the juvenile mammals that have been kicked out of their, their dens or their nests, are off trying to find their own territory, and sometimes they need more time to find food. And they're stupid. They're, they're, they're really inexperienced with cars, so they don't know to avoid cars a lot of times. Um, hunting season, you've got spooked animals that are running to try to avoid people, you know, with guns and bows and arrows and things. Um, cutting down trees. Um, if you can avoid cutting down a tree, please don't cut it down. Even if it's a dead tree, if you can leave a snag of 10 feet or so, it's wonderful habitat for wildlife. We have trees all over our property that we've had cut off the tops because they were going to be falling on the house, but they're not going to hurt anything if they're only 10 feet tall. So if you can do that, and the woodpeckers go crazy. In old dead wood, oh, they love it. Um, if you don't know if you have animals in a tree and the tree is close to your house, angled on your house, or endangering you, wrap on the trunk, try to look, if you can look out of your upstairs window, see if you see animals going in and out. So many times trees get cut down and animals get orphaned. Um, I've, I've got all sorts of horror stories about animals getting cut up with chainsaws. Um, the other thing, glue traps. I don't know how these things are still legal in, in our civilized society. They are the most barbaric things, even for, for mice. If you have to kill mice, do it with a snap trap. If you can't use a, a have horn trap and relocate them, use a snap trap. It's usually quick and painless. I've gotten in bats that have been stuck on glue traps. I've gotten in um, uh, flying squirrels. I've gotten in birds. We had two birds come to the Philly Metro Wildlife Center Wednesday morning. They were um, cat birds that were stuck on the, the glue traps. And the woman said, oh, well, I wasn't trying to hurt the birds. I was trying to catch snakes, which I don't know why that, that makes a great distinction. But that's the thing with, with glue traps and poisons. 
they don't always just affect the targeted species. They affect anything that comes in contact with them. And that's how a lot of our, our raptors get poisoned because they go after the rats or the mice or whatever else. Um, I testified for uh, city council a number of years ago in Philadelphia when they were trying to poison the rats that were in Rittenhouse Park. And we got in a squirrel that had uh, the rat poison in him and I watched him basically suffocate on his own uh, blood. Please don't use poisons. Please don't use glue traps. There are so many other ways. If you really need to kill an animal, there are so many other ways you can do it. Uh, ways to help wildlife. Install a bat house. Bat houses are wonderful. If you get bat houses and put them on the back of your house or river, they should be facing south or east, and they should be up high enough that the bats can swoop out. You won't have problems with mosquitoes. You'll, you'll just have less problems with bugs overall. Plus, it's kind of fun to watch them. Um, and also, you don't want to mount them on a tree because raccoons are very curious, and if they see a bat house, they're going to reach up in there and they could end up killing your bats. Now, here's something you haven't heard at all tonight. Please keep your cats inside. They do, they decimate the wildlife population. They end up with diseases. I'm on a next door group for Valley Forge. There's constantly people that are saying, oh, my cat hasn't been home in five or six days. Someone had their posted, they found it dead. You know, um, either hit by a car, um, gotten by a wild animal. Um, raccoons typically don't fight with, with cats unless there's a food shortage or unless they're trying to protect their kids. Then they can. Coyotes will eat your cats. No doubt about it. There's also a lot of sick people out there that do horrible things to cats. Um, pools. There's something called a frog log. If you have a pool, that's what this is. I think it's something like $15, but you can make your own. Animals constantly fall into pools, and you find them in the, the clean-out, uh, chipmunks and all sorts of things. If you take one of those, they're almost styrofoam things that you kneel on for in the garden, put one in your pool and staple a piece of cloth from that and put it on the side of your, your pool and just put a rock or something on it. Animals can get to that, climb up that, and climb up and out of your pool. Um, that's also... Uh, drink on the fly. Sometimes they'll be going after an insect or sometimes they're going after an ink, uh, 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 drink and they'll swoop and sometimes they swoop a little bit too low and sort of fall into the water. That'll be good for them too. So that's called frog log but like I said you can make your own. You don't have to buy anything. And you can get those neat cat nailer things at the dollar store. I mean it could be cheaper. Um, Okay, opossums, raccoons, foxes, skunks, vultures, and coyotes keep roadways and neighborhoods clean of carrion. They'll eliminate all of that for us. Foxes, coyotes, hawks, owls, and raccoons are excellent at rodent control. Um, bats, birds, opossums, and skunks consume millions of insects every year. Wildlife is good to have around. Aside from being wonderful to watch, they're really good to have around. Coyotes, there's been a lot of talk on, on the next door groups about coyotes. Yes, we do have them in this area. Coyotes are less of a threat for humans than the dog next door. Dogs kill an average of 20 to 30 people per year in the United States. There's only been two reported cases of coyotes killing humans in the United States and Canada. One was a three-year-old in Southern California in 1981. One was a 19-year-old woman in Nova Scotia in 2009. You have more of a chance of being killed by an errant golf ball than being killed by a coyote. So that's just something to remember. Educate your family and friends. I mean, wildlife is wonderful. Start watching them and you watch their family life. It's amazing. Some of the calls I get, nuisance wildlife, that's what I do a good portion of my days when I'm on the phone. Um, 
Because an animal is nocturnal, if you see it in the daytime, it doesn't necessarily mean it has rabies. What you want to look for is abnormal behavior for that species. If an animal, a raccoon or something, if you have not cornered it, and it comes running up to you, growling out of the clear blue, or if it comes running up to you and, and rubs around your legs or something like that, either of those behaviors are very abnormal for any of our native mammals. That's something to watch out for. What if the raccoon is just following? If it's a young one, it, uh, it usually means it's been fed or raised by someone. Yeah, which happens a lot. Yeah, yeah. They shouldn't do that. I would clap my hands, yell at it, don't feed it. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Have you thought about the condos mentioned the time houses? Mm -hmm. um, they seem to be unaware. That just a blanket statement, I think, is, is valid. Uh, they seem to be unaware of the issues of pesticides. They have openings in all of them where you throw things out. Uh, sometimes a recycling might come in, so might work. But the other thing is the cats and right. get in all the time. That's something that a homeowner would have to bring up. Okay. Yeah. Is there? Is there? Yeah. I've done programs at Old Forge Crossing in yeah, Devon. They, yeah. um, they were having a real issue with skunks because someone was feeding them, and then everyone else was up in arms because with their the dogs. The bins there are there's yeah. two sides of them, so they don't put right. Them out, right? Yeah. There's an opening. Right. Every yeah. Old Forge, oh, are you really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ruth. Um, trying to think of the woman's name. Had me come in and do presentations there. Yeah. Well, that's at least that's yeah. good to know that right. they've they walked right. away from me and yeah. for you and yeah. listened. Yeah, so yeah. it did. Home. Yeah, right. But the other thing is dumpsters. A lot of times I get calls with raccoons and dumpsters. Well, they're used to going in there and being able to climb out. Well, all of a sudden it's been emptied and they can climb in there and maybe they can climb out, but maybe their babies can't. Dumpsters should always be kept closed. I mean, if you have to open them up during the daytime for your business or whatever, and, you know, because people are going in and out a lot, close the window, you know, at nighttime. Okay. Thank you for letting me talk about wildlife. Thank you. Thank you.